السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. حياكم الله. وطبتم وطاب ممشاكم وتبوأتم من الجنة منزلة إن شاء الله رب العالمين. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We are still enjoying the journey of the life of the Prophet وسلم, and the stories of his companions and his household and how they suffered in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to deliver this religion to us today. And uh, when we describe the Prophet وسلم, as light or nur, we said that the Prophet وسلم, is described in the Quran with many characteristics. One of them is that he was uh, described as nur or light. And by this we, we mean the nur of guidance, the light of guidance, nur al hidayah and the, the, the nur of uh, just asking people to follow the route and to, the, to follow the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this doesn't mean that he was actually made of light or created out of light because we believe that the Quran so, uh, explains to, to us that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam مَا هُوَ إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ مَا أَنْ إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ So he is a human being but he has received this revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in Surah Al-Nur, كان الإمام ابن عباس يقول مثل نوره كمشكاة هذا يعني مثل نور من آمن به لأن الله سبحانه وتعالى نوره ليس له مثيل وهذا مثل ضربه الله سبحانه وتعالى لنور النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ونور من آمن به فاللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وعلى أصحابه وعلى أتباعه وعلى أزواجه أمهات المؤمنين وعلى أصحابه الغر الميامين وعلينا معهم يا رب العالمين وقبلنا اللهم في حضرة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وجعلنا من التابعين المخلصين الموافقين لسنة الحبيب صلى الله عليه وسلم المشتاقين إلى لقائه وإلى زيارة بيته ومدينته صلى الله عليه وسلم. Last time we stopped at Abyssinia and the time that the Muslims spent in Abyssinia and we said that Al Najashi was uh, one of the believers who believed in Islam. And he didn't meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so he's not considered a Sahabi, a companion, but he's considered a Tabi, one of the followers. Although he was at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he didn't see him. He didn't meet him, like, personally. So a uh, follower is normally somebody who will not be during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so they will be the students of the Sahaba, will be the followers. But for an Najashi, he is a follower while he is at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he accepted Islam while he didn't see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina so Amr ibn al-As later became a Sahabi because he met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and stayed with him. And so an Najashi accepted Islam before Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As. And that's why we said that Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As is the only Sahabi who embraced Islam on the hands of a tabi'i, of a follower who is a Najashi. And we said that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, like testified that he, Najashi, Najashi Ashama, was one of the mu'mineen, and he prayed on him, uh, Salatul Ghaib. So when a Najashi died, the Prophet Sallallahu received the, uh, the, the information about that from Sayyidina Jibreel, and so he summoned the people in Medina in order to pray al janaza. But I mean, the dead person, the deceased person is not there. The body is not available. The body is in a Pessinia. That's why this was the first Salatul Ghaib. This is a janazah prayer for the, the absent body. And so the Prophet ﷺ summoned all the Muslimin in this place, which is now known as Masjid Abi Bakr Siddiq. So if you go to Medina, this is Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. And this area here is called Al-Musallah where the Prophet Sallallahu used to pray Salawat al-Eid. And uh, how many Eid prayer did the Prophet Sallallahu pray in Medina? Around? 
Okay, so how many salawat of Eid do we have in every year? Two. Two. So, and how many years did he spend in Medina? Ten. Okay, so they can be 20, but let's say that they are like 15 because one of them, for example, is during Hajjat al Wada. So he, he was not in Medina. He was at, at, like witnessing that while he was in Hajj. Another one, he might be outside because of when he was in uh, Fath Makkah, it was in the 20th of Ramadan. So it, he will attend Salat al Eid also in Mecca and not in, in Medina. So let's say around 15 Salawat of Salat al Eid, and he was the Imam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he used to pray at different places, but in the same area. And so uh, uh, this area is called Al Musalla, which is Musalla al Eid. And in one hadith, Fi al Bukhari, Walakin Laysa fi Sahih, Fi Kitab al Tariq al Kabir. للإمام البخاري حديث says ما بين بيتي والمصلى روضة من رياض الجنة so we know the hadith of ما بين بيتي ومنبري روضة من رياض الجنة between my house and my member is a روضة which is part of الجنة meadow of, of الجنة of paradise but this hadith says ما بين بيتي والمصلى so the Bayt al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is underneath the green dome and all of this space would be part of Jannah. All what is in the picture would be part of Jannah. And the Prophet وسلم, used to go to Salawat al-Eid from one way, and then when he returns, he will not follow the same route, he will change the route. And when he was asked about this, he said, because there are different angels on different uh, sides of the alleys and the streets, and he likes to uh, uh, receive salam from different angels in his way forward and backward. So Masjid Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is called Masjid Abu Bakr al-Siddiq because after the death of the Prophet sallallahu each one of the Khulafa led the prayer of al Eid in the same area that the Prophet sallallahu used to lead the, 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 the prayer, but they just chose one area of that to be fixed for them. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq chose this part where the Prophet sallallahu prayed before and this became the prayer place of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq when leading Salawat al Eid. And this is where Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab used to do it. And this is where Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib also used to do it. And in fact, Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan also used to do it in this same place, but there is no mosque for him now. I mean, there is a mosque nearby, but it is out of the area of the Musalla. And in the middle, we have this Masjid, Masjid al ghamama and this is the biggest masjid of Musalla because this is where the Prophet وسلم, most of the time prayed Al Eid. And it's called Al Ghamama uh, <clears throat> because in the literature, there are instances where the Prophet وسلم, was uh, shaded by the clouds, especially when it was very hot and people do not find the shade of any tree, then he will be shaded by uh, the clouds. And it happened when before even the message, when he went to Al-Sham, to the Levant, and Maysara, the slave of Sayyidah Khadija, was with him. He witnessed this and he said that this happened. And when he was younger, like a teenager, and his uncle Abu Talib got him near to Al-Kaaba, and they both prayed for uh, rain to come, uh, because uh, Quraysh at that time were in very drought and famine. Uh, Abu Talib, uh, just once they finished supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the Kaaba place, uh, water came from the sky and rain came to the people and the saving water came to them. So Abu Talib said, وَأَبْيَضُ يُسْتَسْقَ الْغَمَامُ بِوَجْهِهِ بِمَارُ الْيَتَامَ عَصْمَةٌ لِلْأَرَامِلِ يَلُوذُ بِهِ الْهُلَّاكُ مِنْ آلِهَا شِمٍ فَهُمْ عِنْدَهُ فِي حَضَرَةٍ وَفَوَاضٍ So this is where al the Prophet ﷺ prayed al janaza Salatul Ghaib on uh, al Najashi. Uh, before we leave Pasinia, al Habasha, and what happened there, we just would like to um, have a few uh, like uh, things to uh, to ponder about, to contemplate, to see the lessons that we learn from this, because we are, or most of us in this country, are also immigrants, and uh, these early immigrants to Al Habasha to Abyssinia, in fact, were following the directions and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet. So, the first thing we learn from this is that it is okay to migrate if you fear that your religion is in danger. It is okay to flee with your religion 
even to a non-Muslim country, because Abyssinia at this time was not a Muslim country. But the Prophet ﷺ directed the Muslimin to go there with only one privilege, which is إِنَّهُ مَلِكٌ لَا يُظْلَمُ عِنْدَهُ أَحَدٌ So it's a place where just privilege, where there is just, where you can be okay with your religion. You will not be afraid that you will be suffering from uh, or persecuted for your religion. Second, uh, the early Muslimin who went to Abyssinia had uh, one major duty, which is not to call for Islam among the Abyssinians, but to keep the Islam of their own children and their own offspring so that they will not get uh, lost in this new community. This new community is so powerful, so sophisticated compared to the community in Mecca. And so they need to keep the religion. This doesn't mean that they don't call for Islam. They call for Islam, but by, by being um, a model or an example for others to see how Islam is um, manipulated or affected on this earth. But it was so important for them to keep the religion for their children, other than getting new people into this religion. And why this happening? Because three of the early Muhajireen converted to Christianity under the uh, the common stream or the mainstream culture that was there. One of them is Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, Akhu Abdullah ibn Jahsh, and who was also the husband of Sayyida uh, Umm Habiba bint Abi Sufyan. So it's very important because yeah, the uh, <laughs> the prevailing culture can affect the people a lot. So we need to integrate with the culture, but at the same time, we don't need to uh, assimilate or be assimilated or forget who we are. It is not the melting pot, the American example of the melting pot, where all the ingredients are uh, mixing together, and so you cannot identify any of these ingredients, but it is more of the salad bar. In the salad bar, you have different components and different ingredients, and you can see them, and it makes like a tapestry or an integrated form of salad, but at the same time, each part is very important, and you cannot do without it. Uh, when they went to Abyssinia, one third lesson that is very important is that they were not just like strangers in a strange country. They wanted to integrate. So they helped uh, al Najashi in his war and they said to him, if you need us to fight with you, we will do this. But al Najashi said, no, I would like you just to keep near to the sea. If we are defeated, then go away. If we are not defeated, then you are safe in this country. But they didn't like accept this. They sent Sayyidina Zubair ibn al-Awam to swim across the Nile to see the battle and to report the news of the battle. So it's very important to care about the community where you live because you're part of this country and you should participate in the common good for the people of this country. Uh, one other lesson is, although we cooperate and we communicate for the common good of humans in this country, it is very important to be very clear about the principles of Islam, about the principles of our identity. When Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As came to an Najashi and asked uh, him and made the trek and he said, ask them what they believe in Jesus, in Isa ibn Maryam, the Muslimin thought that this was like a calamity because now this is so much like confronting and opposing the ideas and the creed of the people of Abyssinia. But they said, we will say just what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to say and what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us to say. And so they recited Bidayat uh, Surat Maryam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them by being truthful and being honest to their religion. Uh, still another lesson is to take care of the newcomers, of the other immigrants who are newcomers. We learned that Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was in Yemen and he wanted to migrate to the Prophet ﷺ, but he was afraid that he will be captured by the Meccans if he take the land route. So he took the sea route, but what happened is that the wind got the ships to the African coast and the ships were wrecked, so he couldn't do it. And he became an immigrant in uh, Al Habasha in Abyssinia. And so there was no one to take care of him except for the early Muslimin who went there before. 
He says, فَأَقَمْنَا بِخَيْرِ مَقَامٍ عِنْدَ جَعْفَرِ He didn't say عِنْدَ النَّجَاشِ عِنْدَ جَعْفَرِ Which means that Jafar رضي الله عنه was like the custodian of the Muslimin there and he was taking care of them and then he was also providing help and support for the newcomers and new immigrants which is very important to take care of and to show solidation with them. Um, one last uh, lesson that we learned from Abyssinia is bilingualism. It is OK if you don't speak Arabic well. It is OK if you don't understand Arabic. As long as you are a good Muslim, you can recite the Quran, you do your prayers. In fact, learning another language or knowing another language can be one of the blessings of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala for you so that you preach this religion and you deliver this religion to the people of this country. It is wonderful if you have both languages you can speak arabic and you can speak another language but if you cannot speak the arabic language like the arabs it is okay as long as you can express islam in the beautiful way that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us where do we know this from we've seen the example of a sayyida um, uh, we talked about um, Muhalid, the little child that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam got and she didn't speak arabic she didn't understand Arabic, so the Prophet Sallallahu talked to her in a Pessinian and chose a word or an expression from a Pessinian and said, Sana Um Khalid, is this beautiful? Do you like this? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approved using another language, especially for the young children who have been born in another culture. This doesn't mean that you stop learning the Arabic language. This is a sacred language that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala chose for his book, for his last book. And uh, it is a language that the Prophet وسلم, your beloved Prophet وسلم, spoke. So you should be eager to learn this language and to understand this language and to understand the beauty of the Quran, in addition to being eloquent in your own uh, first language that you acquired from this community and use it for the service of Islam. So these are just some of the lessons that we learn from the uh, journey uh, from the Hijra of the early Muslim to Abyssinia. And we move on to returning back to Mecca. In fact, there is one thing before we leave that, which is what happened to Amara ibn al-Walid. We said that Amara ibn al-Walid had a tragic end. And uh, we said that we will speak about that. OK, so when Amr ibn al-As was sent as a delegate from the people of Mecca in order to get back the early Muslimin from uh, Pessinia, Something happened in the sea, on the sea, on the way going to Habasha. Um, Amr ibn Az had a mate, or uh, like a female slave. And Amr ibn al-Walid was so like handsome and well-built athlete. And he started talking to this uh, lady on uh, the ship. Amr ibn al-Az was short and was not as strong as Amr ibn al-Walid. So he didn't like that, and they fought together. So what happened? Amara just carried Amr and threw him into the sea. And so this was so humiliating to Amr and people of, of Arabia don't know how to swim. They don't have a sea and so they do not, most of them don't swim. So he was about to uh, get drowned or to sink in. So uh, he said, please get me back to the ship and uh, everything is done between us. So there is no hard feelings. And so they got him back onto the ship. He went to Amr ibn al-Walid and said, if people from Quraysh knew that we fought each other, your people, your tribe might get into trouble with my tribe. So let me write for you a vow uh, or a disclaimer that whatever happens to me, you are innocent from that. I do not accuse you that you did it to me. And you do the same to me. So whatever happens to you, you clarify me from that. I'm not the cause of doing this. And this was the beginning of the trick. And so they wrote these two different like pieces of manuscripts for each other. And then he kept this kind of disclaimer from Amar ibn al-Walid. When they went to Habasha, and then he saw how an Najashi Asqama was so reluctant to give the Muslimin back, he tried to make another trick. So he went to Amar ibn al-Walid and said, you know, the wife of uh, al-Najashi al is so beautiful. And I think that she can speak with you if you just approach her. And so day by day, he said, just try to talk to her so that she can talk to her husband. And uh, by affecting her husband, he will 
uh, give us this Muslimin back and get them to us. Uh, and so the job will be fulfilled and the mission will be accomplished. So day by day, he said, I could talk to the wife of an Najash. He said, I don't believe you in order to convince me that you really did get me something from the properties, from the private things of an Najash, from his own bedroom. And he said, what do you expect to get? He said, get me like a bottle of his perfume, the perfumes of the people of Africa there. So the next day he got him this bottle of perfume. As he got this bottle of perfume, he armed and took this bottle of perfume and went to an Najashi and said, OK, thank you. Uh, I understand why you don't want to get these Muslimin back to me. But just as a piece of advice, I know that the colleague who came with me is doing uh, like bad things in your household. And this is the proof. When Najashi saw the bottle of his perfume at the hand of Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As at that time, he became mad. And so he asked his guards to get uh, Amar ibn al-Walid. And then he said, in our religion, we do not kill messengers and delegates, but we will do something worse than killing. And so he got some of his uh, sorcerers, magicians, the people who make spells, and he asked them to cast a spell on him. And they began casting a spell on him. And once they finished, he couldn't bear to stand with any human. And he was, just went into the jungle and lived with the animals and the beasts. And his clothes turned out and his hair grew and his nails, well, he became just mostly like a primitive caveman and he stayed in a cave. And this was like his end. And when Amr came back to Mecca and they asked about him, the people with, with Amr and with the, with the ship told them that the Najashi did that to him. And they said, because he did that to the wife of the Najashi. Then they said, this is a trick from Amr. Amr must have done them. Then he showed them the manuscript uh, that uh, he wrote that he is OK and nothing is to be accused of Sayyidina Amr for doing this. Years later, uh, one of the Muslimin from Medina, and he is of a kinsman uh, from the same tribe of Aymar ibn al -Walid, decided to go and search for the man. And he went to Abyssinia and he looked for him and then he was guided into the jungle and he went through the jungle and went from one cave to other till he finally saw him and he was more like a bear with all the hair on his body and with his gaze kind of dizzy and, uh, and not concentrating uh, like the, the look of a madman. And he said, you will come with me. I will not leave you here. He said just one sentence. If you take me from here, I will die. I know that if I leave this place, I will die. But the, the Sahabi was so firm. So he said, I will take you whether you agree or not. And so he tried to take him by force. But then Amar started yelling and screaming, and then he died. And he was buried in the jungle in uh, uh, Pessinia in Africa, and no one knows about his grave uh, anymore. So this was like a subsidiary story that happened uh, during the this uh, journey to Abyssinia. We get back to Mecca and see what the Prophet وسلم, and the early Sahaba did. And we see that uh, the uh, Mushrikeen were, accept, were like reacting to the Quran in different ways. So although they liked listening to the Quran and they valued how the eloquence of the Quran is like no other and that the Quran can never be matched or made the same of, they still mocked the Prophet ﷺ and they still asked for miracles. So some of the ayats, some of the verses of the Quran were revealed concerning some of the uh, mushrikeen. So, for example, we know that Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl was one of the biggest enemies of Islam. And, the, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ عَدُوًا مِنَ الْمُجْرِمِينَ So he is, in fact, the enemy uh, uh, of Islam. And uh, in Ghazwat Badr, Abu Jahl was the one who uh, cursed himself because he before starting the, the battle he said Allahumma aqta'na lirrahim ihnihi al-ghada this means ya Allah whoever of us has cut all the uh, kinship relations uh, get him killed this 
evening and he was killed. So in fact, he cursed himself by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do it. Abi Lahab and his uh, wife, also we have seen Surah Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, we said that this is the man who uh, accepted Islam and then he apostated and he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and tried to spit on the face of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed this ayah يَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ وَيَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَا الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا يَا وَيْلَتَ لَيْتَنِ لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا Because Ubayy ibn Khalaf, his friend, told him that unless you go back to Muhammad and say that you left Islam and you spit on his face, I will not be your friend. So he did that in order to keep the friendship of Ubay ibn Khalaf. And, <laughs> and in the Day of Judgment, he would say, يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا He will regret doing this. Walid ibn al-Mughira uh, was the one who understood the Quran and he told the people of Quraysh, I will tell you what this is. Is it like sorcery? Was it poetry? Is it like a spell that he's casting on us? And then when he read and listened to the Quran, he began to think and then think again and contemplate and contemplate again. And finally he said, oh, this is sorcery and this is a sorcerer. And the Quran described what he did. إِنَّهُ فَكَّرَ وَقَدَّرَ فَقُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرَ ثُمَّ قُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرَ ثُمَّ نَظَرْ ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَسَرْ ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ وَاسْتَكْبَرَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing every part of feeling or emotion that he's showing while he's contemplating and thinking of a way out of this dilemma to describe what this message should be like. Um, Al-Aqnas ibn Turayq also uh, was uh, described as Hamaz in Mashain. Al-Aqnas ibn Turayq um, insulted the Prophet sallallahu just once. So he like uh, said a bad word about the Prophet sallallahu And we know from the hadith that man salla alayya salatan sallallahu biha alayhi how many times? Ashra. So whenever you offer salutation and salal for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a reward will make a salah and salam for you ten times. And likewise, whoever insults the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam once, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala insults him ten times. And now count this. وَلَا تُطَعْ كُلَّ حَلَّافٍ مَهِينٍ هَمَّازٍ مَشَّاءٍ بِنَمِيمٍ مَنَّاعٍ لِلْخَيْرِ مُعْتَدٍ أَثِيمٍ عُتُلٍ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ زَنِيمٍ أَنْ كَانَ ذَا مَالٍ وَبَنِينٍ إِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِ آيَاتُنَا قَالَ أَصَاطِيرُ الْأَوَلِينَ سَنَسِمُهُ عَلَى الْخُطُبِ So, ten insults to the man who insulted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on his nose. And marking in the nose was a kind of a humiliating uh, mark in the Jahiliya, which is during the war time, rather than killing your enemy, you just kill, uh, get part of the nose down. And this means that this is like a captive of war or a slave of war, but he's so much like degraded and humiliated. And this happened during Ghazwat Badr. And they knew that this is the man because his uh, nose was cut and subhanallah the tin insults were to him. Uh, another ibn al-Harith was a man uh, who was expecting uh, the, the, the messenger and the prophet of the last uh, the last prophet and when uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, sent the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he uh, was one of the deniers. So وَأَقْسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ جَهْدَ أَيْمَانِهِمْ لَإِنْ جَاءَهُمْ نَذِيرٌ لَيَكُونُنَّ أَهْدَ مِنْ أَهْدَ الْأُمْمِ So they made vows to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if a warner of a messenger comes to them, they will accept him and then they will be guided. فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ نَذِيرٌ مَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا نُفُورًا So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to them and they knew that he was the Prophet, they didn't accept that and they didn't embrace Islam. So what another Ibn al-Harith did, because he saw how fascinating with the Quran and part of it was telling the stories of the Anbiya, of the, of the Prophets. So he went to Persia and there he took a crash course, a very uh, like condensed course in the history of Persia and on the stories and the myth of the early Persian uh, emperors. 
And on the fantasy uh, tales of Rustum and Esfindian, these were like leaders in the armies of the Persians. And then he went back to Mecca and said, if Muhammad is telling you this in the Quran, I can tell you better than this. So come to me and I'll tell you the stories of the early emperors and kings of Persia. And when he saw that he's not matching the style of the Quran, he hired two singers, two uh, female slaves who were singers with their an instruments. And so they, he began now to make performances rather than just telling the stories. He's telling the stories with poetry, with music, and with the, the slaves like dancing. And so in order to get the people to him and make uh, make them leave the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, Al-Harith al al ibn Qais al-Sahmi uh, used to, to worship a black stone, a very small black stone, but in his way to his trade, he found a bitter white stone. He threw away the black stone and started worshipping it. Then after some time, he found uh, a bitter red stone. So. He threw the white stone and started uh, like worshipping the red stone. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Afara'ayta man ittakhada ilahahu hawa. In fact, his God was not any of these stones. It was his own whims and his own desires. So whatever he likes, then he takes and then he dislikes, he throws away. And this shows how ignorant they were. Uh, <clears throat> Ubay ibn Khalaf came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he got a very um, part of a bone from an animal or uh, a cattle that was slaughtered and it was a very old time so it was so old uh, bone and he came to the Prophet and he said look this is an example look at this uh, bone and then he started freaking it with his fingers and it turned into dust and he said do you think that this will come back after this this will be resurrected then the Prophet said yes this will be resurrected and you will be resurrected and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get you into hellfire. Uh, and Allah at the end of Surah Yaseen says, وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقًا So he tried to give us an example and he forgot how he was created. قَالَ مَنْ يُحْيِي الْعَظَامَ وَهِيَ رَمِيمٌ So these are the bones and they are dead. Is there anybody who can revive them, get them back to life? Al-As ibn Wa'il, this was the, the father of Amr ibn Al-As, uh, one day, like, also inserted the Prophet وسلم, around the Kaaba, and then when he left, uh, people around him said, shan't we go and beat him? They mean the Prophet وسلم, said, no, give them, he is an abtar. An abtar, this means that he doesn't have male children and this means when he dies uh, there is no like uh, of his children become men to carry this message you just leave him and he will perish so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also answered this and said so in fact not you uh, in fact this uh, in, uh, man who insults you is the one who is cut off from his uh, lineage and the Prophet says, كل تقي, كل So the uh, concept of Ahlul Bayt, Rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu alaykum Ahlul Bayt, innahu hamidun majid. Ahlul Bayt means the household of the Prophet وسلم, And in the Sunnah, this means Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Fatima, and their offspring, Al-Hasan, wa Al-Hussein, wa uh, uh, Zainab, Rudwan Allah alayhim wa alayhum salam, and also Umama bint Zainab bint Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Sayyidina al-Abbas and the descendants of Sayyidina al-Abbas because all of these uh, were not accepting sadaqah as part of the um, the privileges of Ahl al-Bayt. But the Prophet ﷺ then explained that the concept of Ahl al-Bayt is not just related to blood, it is more related to the religion and to the creed, to the creed and to the belief and to the faith. So he says, and I am the grandfather of everyone who is patient among you. When Nabi Awla bil Mu'minina min anfusihim wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum. So if his uh, wives are our mothers, then the Prophet is like a father to all the Mu'minin and to all the Muslimin. 
Omeya ibn Khalaf was also making faces, you know, when the little child, children make faces to others in order to tease them. So he was making faces to the Prophet Sallallahu and to the Muslimin whenever they pass by. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, mentioned this in the Quran. Okay, now we move to the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu So we said that the, the biggest miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu was the Quran because the Quran was unmatched and translatable and parable. And uh, it was the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the very bitten word of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And uh, there was this challenge every day for them, get a Quran like this one. If you cannot get the Quran like this one, get 10 surahs like it. If you cannot get 10 surahs, get just one surah. And if you cannot just get one surah, at least try to say words like the ones that are mentioned in the Quran, while you know that they are made from the same letters that you make your words from. So words like alif, uh, like letters like alif, la, mim, and ayin, sin, qaf, and taha. All of these are just disconnected letters, and still you cannot get letters like these and say this is a Quran like this one. However, the Prophet ﷺ was given other miracles in order to prove his uh, message. And one of the biggest miracles that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, showed to the people of Quraysh is the splitting of them. So most scholars say that this happened when uh, the uh, Moshitin of Quraysh asked for a miracle, and this was one of the biggest miracles. Some of the scholars say uh, this will happen at the day of judgment as a uh, mark to the end of times. But in Al-Bukhari, we say uh, that Haddathana uh, Abdullah ibn Abdul Wahab عن قداتا عن أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه أن أهل مكة سألوا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أن يريهم آية فأراهم القمر شقتين حتى رأوا حراء بينهما. So the people of Mecca asked the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم for a miracle, and he said, "Do you see this moon? It was at the night time." They said, "Yes." He said, "If I split it in two parts to you, uh, will you?" believe and they said yes of course i mean we have never seen the the, mo the moon split into two halves before then he prayed to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the moon was split into two halves and one half was on jabal abi qabis and the other half was on jabal and between these two is jabal al nur where ghar hira is and jabal al nur is a very high mountain and it is pointed so it is very well marked. And they saw one half of the moon on the right and one half on the left. And Hira, the, uh, the cave of Hira, the Mount of Light, was in the middle between them. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ishhadu, witness this and testify that you have witnessed this. So what, they, what did they say? They said, this is really mighty sorcery mighty magic he made all our eyes to see this moon splitting but it is not true it didn't happen so some of them said oh, if muhammad is so powerful he cannot be so powerful to uh, dazzle the eyes of people who are not present so ask the people in al Badi, ask the people in the desert, ask the people who are outside Mecca, because we are not the only people who see the moon at night. There should be other people who see the, the moon at night. So did they see this ayah or not? So in the morning, when Bedouin came to Mecca to buy and sell, they asked them, did you notice anything last night? They said, yes, we saw the, the moon into two halves, and to split into halves. And so then they knew that this was really a miracle. But Abu Jahl said what? Sahrun Mustamir. His, his sorcery, his magic is still continuing. And so it uh, flooded to other areas. And till today, some of the atheists would ask this question. They say we don't have a record in history that the moon was split. We don't have a proof. 
from archaeology that the moon was split. In fact, there is there is some proof for this. Some in some other cultures in India, there is a record for a king, for an Indian king. His name is Chakrawani or Mass, or as it is written. And it is recorded and documented that he was sitting with his wife in his palace and he saw the splitting of the moon. And he was in Malabar in, in, in India. And then he, he didn't understand why this happening and how can this be uh, true? I mean, the, then the, uh, the moon was come back into one whole moon at the same night. They say that it took like from four to six hours in order to come back. But then uh, one of his sons went to Arabia in uh, trade and he knew from people in Arabia that there is a prophet and for this prophet, the moon was split. So he went back to his father and he told him about this. The king of India decided to meet the prophet وسلم, and in order to testify that he witnessed this ayah and this miracle. And in some of the books, Mustadrak al-Hakim and Abi Sa'id ibn al-Khudri, he said, Ahda malikul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, jarratan fiha zanjabeel. So this king of India uh, gave as a present or a gift to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba a jar that has got ginger inside. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam atama ashabahu qita'atan qata'a. He gave his companions uh, each one a piece, including myself. And then this king, this uh, Indian king, told the Prophet وسلم, of the day and the night where he witnessed the splitting of the moon. And uh, Al Sheikh Hamidullah, uh, Hamidullah, uh, Muhammad Hamidullah, an Indian scholar, has got this book, Muhammad Rasulullah, وسلم, a concise survey of the life and work of the founder of Islam, said that he found the manuscript in India where this is mentioned. And he gave us the number of the manuscript, which is uh, 2807-152, uh, the pages from 152 to 173, where this is exactly written that he has seen this. And this king established the first mosque in India, and it was also in Malabar, and later the Tabi'i Malik ibn Dinar went to India and he was buried in near to this mosque. And in India, they say that this was established in 629 AD. 629, this is during the, the life of the Prophet وسلم, in the Georgian calendar. And this is again the, the, the number of the manuscript from Hamidullah, uh, Muhammad Hamidullah. Uh, in fact, we need more research into the life of this king and how he met the Prophet وسلم, whether he met him or not, and how he witnessed this miracle. But this is just one evidence from uh, the manuscripts of the Indians, and there is another copy. In fact, the original is in the British Library in London, and the copy is in New Delhi. And so this is the Far East. What about the Far West? We have also another evidence from Mexico from uh, the people of the Maya. The people of the Maya have this manuscript where they uh, uh, drew the moon like a man's face that is split into half. And they tell us that they were celebrating one of their uh, early like primitive feasts or celebrations and they saw the moon splitting into two halves and so in the manuscripts this is mentioned in addition to that there is a third one in madrid in spain it's called the madrid codex also related to the maya people where they uh, used to embody the different uh, planets into animals and the moon into the shape of a rabbit but they drew the, the rabbit's face split into half. And when asked about this, because this was the only time they drew it split into half, they said at this festival, at this year, it was split into half. So subhanAllah, it's, it is in the folklore of the people in the West and in the East. It is recorded in Madrid. It is recorded in London, in New Delhi, and in Persia. In addition, uh, astronauts and people who are specializing in astrology say that, in fact, this happens every day. 
and they give us the example of one of the moons of Saturn. So, you know, Saturn, the big uh, planet that has got the circle around it, it has more than nine moons. And they recorded in 1970 something the splitting of Titan, which was one of the moons. And it was split because of the gravity of the planet. And then it came back again uh, by this force, uh, like the the, uh, the, uh, the the force that gets uh, bodies clearer and nearer to the, the core and gets it far or away from the core. So it happens and it can happen to different moons and not just one moon. So we believe what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the book, Iqtarabat al-Sa'atu wa Shaq al-Qamar, but just as a proof to the people who are non-believing, especially from the atheists, we got these uh, like proofs. Another uh, miracle of the Prophet was the walking tree. And this walking tree, uh, this is Masjid in Mecca. It's called Masjid al-Shajara. And Masjid al-Shajara is just directly next to the gate of the cemetery, Muqbarat al-Mu'alla. So if you go to Mecca in, in Umrah or in Hajj, most likely after each prayer, there was there will be a, a janazah prayer. If you attend the janazah prayer and participate in the prayer, you'll get this ajr, like the size of the mountain of Uhud, of Hasanat and, and good deeds. But then if you follow it, to the cemetery and to the graveyard, you will see this masjid. This masjid was the place of a tree, an old tree in Mecca. And the Prophet وسلم, <clears throat> in the books of Sirah says that uh, the, the Prophet وسلم, was at Al Hujun, so the area is called Al Hujun. And we know that this is called Al Hujun because before that we said that Sayyidah Khadija is uh, buried in this uh, cemetery. And the Sudanese guys uh, always say, "Qif bil hujuni suwayatan ya hadi wa qiri salama uhayla dak al wadi wa qiri salama alayk ya umm al wara man khususat bil majd wal isad." So uh, he was at al hujun, this area, when the mushrikeen were always like saying that he is a liar, that he is a poet, that he is a wizard, that he is a sorcerer that the Prophet Sallallahu became heavy at heart and became so much offended and feeling so bad. So he supplicated to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala and says, Ya Allah, show me a miracle. لا أبالي من بعدها ما كذبني قومي. Show me a miracle that will relieve me from all of these burdens and that I will not care whatever they say after that. So Sayyidina Jibreel came and said, now ask this tree, this far tree, to come to you. The Prophet Sallallahu asked the tree to come, and in front of the eyes of the people of Mecca and the Muslimin and the Mushrikeen, they saw the tree coming to the Prophet Sallallahu making like a trench in the ground, coming to the Prophet Sallallahu till it leant on him and shaded him with its uh, branches and spoke. And said, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa annaka ya Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw this, he became so much relieved and he looked at, at the other people around and said, Ishhadu, now witness this. Then he asked the tree to get back to its place and it came back to its place. Subhanallah al azim and the, and the mosque is still there, uh, the mosque of the walking tree. But near to, you, to this mosque, there is another mosque that is also a mark of another miracle. And this other miracle is where when the Prophet ﷺ met the jinn for the night and he preached Islam and he talked to them about Islam. So how did the Prophet ﷺ meet the jinn? What did they speak to him? How was it like? And where at the mosque now? This is something that we will know about next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. اه حسيتك يعني جزاك الله خير الحمد لله